Oh, it just says starting. He's still in shop and look. Okay, I think we're, yeah, I think we're live on both. I'm just going to put my phone back down again, precariously. Okay, so welcome everyone to this um, Instagram and Facebook live. Um, we are going to cover quite a lot. First of all, I'm Amy. Um, so I'm the lab manager of Care Chester um, and Care Liverpool, and I'm joined by... I'm Vicky Sefton, I'm the Medical Director at Care Chester and I am the Deputy Medical Director at Care Liverpool. So we're going to do um, a, about half an hour uh, and we're going to cover quite a lot or at least we'll try. We've been inundated with questions, I think we've had over a hundred so we're definitely not going to get through them all unfortunately but we are going to try our best to get through as many as possible. So we're going to... oh. I'm reconnecting. I hope I didn't lose you for very long there. Um, so we're going to start off with a bit about um, the impact of COVID on fertility treatment. We're going to talk about the vaccination. There's been lots of questions about that. Um, we're going to talk about safety in clinics, waiting times, um, and talk a bit about NHS funding. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit more about general sort of fertility questions in treatment and um, preparing for treatment, that sort of thing. So we're going to start off with a few key points about COVID um, in our clinics. Um, and Vicky's going to take this one. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think it's important to know that all of the main care clinics are open for treatment um, and that we're open to both new and current patients. And we adhere to government guidance in that you are allowed to leave home for all medical appointments and to travel to your clinic. So that's just to make sure that you feel safe that you are allowed to do that. Um, we've put really rigorous safety measures in place to keep both patients and staff safe in terms of um, social distancing, different screens. We all have the appropriate PPE for the correct areas. So just to reassure you that care as a whole is tried to maintain as much as possible, keeping clinics open and a safe delivery of care. Yeah. yeah. So we've obviously new patients um, can get in touch with us still. We've got the GEM team and you can find numbers on websites, get in touch with us, we're, we're all open. Um, and obviously, if you've got any questions, if you're a current care patient, you can still get in touch with, with your clinic um, as usual. And as Vicky mentioned, social distancing. We did this last time, but we should just demonstrate that we, we are. are we are distanced, although That's we don't have That's why I'm sat at the back. <laughs> yeah. I'm so far away. So if you can't hear me, I'll shout up. But yeah, or let us know on the comments, on the yeah, and we can, <laughs> we can talk louder. Okay, so um, some more specific questions around uh, COVID. So we've gone through the general, um, but what are the current rules and restrictions in clinics due to COVID? So we have had to adapt a very different way of working, but we're, we're quite used to this new normal now. Um, most specifically, we're doing more remote consultations, which are via video calls, via Skype or telephone. Um, and that's with our doctors, our nurses and our counsellors. So we won't be expecting you to attend for consultations, we can do that remotely. We've also um, developed some of our hormone tests that we need to do for your pre-treatment assessments. That can be done via a kit at home, by a small finger prick blood sample. Um, minimal contact drop off for semen analysis, so the semen analysis, the sample can be produced at home and dropped off at your clinic. We've also obviously adapted our layouts for social distancing and some of our clinical protocols have changed to be able to reduce the number of visits that you have to have for monitoring, but to do that in the safest way so it doesn't affect your treatment outcome. Um, in the lab, we have the do not disturb yep. safety procedures in that embryos are left undisturbed from the day of fertilisation until day five when will be your planned embryo replacement. Yep. 
and we screen all patients and staff with a COVID questionnaire prior to attendance to make sure that um, there is no risk of anyone attending with COVID symptoms. Hand hygiene is important. We've got many wash stations throughout all of the clinics, hand sanitizers, um, and obviously we've got lots of details about the changes we've made about your specific clinic on the website so that you can always get that information if you need it. Yeah. And we've had quite a lot of questions about what happens if you test positive. So we do, um, we, as Vicky said, we do do a screen, a questionnaire at the beginning to, to, to make sure that you, you don't have any symptoms, but sometimes during treatment or um, during you taking your drugs, um, you might test positive. So um, if you have symptoms, uh, you can choose to cancel your treatment or we can offer you a test. Um, and obviously that would check if you had an active COVID infection. If you did test positive, then we would obviously need to cancel the treatment. Um, if you develop symptoms after egg collection, for example, or had a positive test after egg collection, then we would request freezing all of the embryos, not replacing an embryo um, until you are out of the isolation. Um, so yeah, obviously to protect staff and our other patients, we don't treat anyone with an active COVID infection. Yeah, and particularly for Chester, because we're based in an NHS trust site, we have to adhere to the trust policy of anyone attending for a clinical procedure has to have a negative COVID test. So our nursing team will arrange that for you during your stimulation phase or during, during your medication ahead of a frozen embryo transfer. And if that can't be arranged with us at the Chester site, we can arrange that for you. Well, we can assist you and signpost you to how you can access that local to yourself and then provide the evidence to us of a negative test. Yeah. Um, so another question uh, from a few people, are partners allowed to accompany patients for appointments such as embryo transfer? So this does differ from clinic to clinic within care just because of the setup and the space um, that each clinic has obviously is very different. Um, in Chester, unfortunately at the moment, partners aren't allowed to attend for embryo transfer or, or any procedures. Um, but obviously we're, we're constantly reviewing um, and as soon as it becomes safe for us to allow that, then, then we will. Um, but get in touch with your local care clinic because it could be different um, in your area. Okay, so now vaccine yeah. questions. Um, we've already had a couple of questions pop through live um, about the vaccine. So perhaps you could go over the guidance that yeah. there is at the moment. So on the 30th of December, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation um, put out national guidance. And the bottom line is that um, women who are trying to become pregnant do not need to avoid pregnancy after vaccination. So if you are planning to start treatment and you are offered the vaccine, we would advise you to have it. It will not impact or delay your treatment starting. And that's the most up-to-date guidance that we have from the JCVI. Um, there's also been more recent guidance from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists um, that's just come out this week to say that there is no impact on fertility it, by having the vaccine. So it will not um, cause a reduction in your fertility and you shouldn't, women who are trying to become pregnant should not be worried about having the vaccine. Yeah, and certainly if you're offered it anywhere, um, I think we should say take it. Take it, um, absolutely. Definitely have it. There's, there's nothing to say you shouldn't at the moment and also if you achieve a pregnancy um, then and you're in a high risk group so you're a frontline healthcare worker um, or in any of those groups that are currently being invited for the vaccine there is no reason why you can't have it during pregnancy it's not being routinely offered to all pregnant women unless you are in a different clinically vulnerable or higher risk group or a frontline or key worker so, but there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't have it. Okay, um, has everything been slowed down because of COVID? Um, are there longer waiting times for treatments? 
So I think this is difficult to answer for the whole of the care group yeah. because um, many of our clinics have no waiting time to access treatment at all. Um, and certainly if you are a self-funded patient for Chester, we would be able to see you for new consultation within seven days and you will be able to start treatment by your next cycle, your next period. But if you are an NHS patient currently, the way NHS treatment is funded is based on where you are registered with your GP. And each GP practice belongs to a different clinical commissioning group. And some of those CCGs, clinical commissioning groups, have put a cap on the number of treatment cycles that a fertility unit can provide. Um, and that cap is in place at the moment until March. Um, and it is quite restrictive at this moment in time for Pan Lancashire and Pan Cheshire. So we, we do have a, a, a slight wait for treatment for an NHS. So if you, if you were coming for treatment and you're NHS funded and you're starting your journey today, then it would be unlikely that you would have treatment for the next two to three months. Um, that's the current wait time. But there, you can access pre-treatment investigations through care if you can't get referred by your GP in for those investigations because some there is waiting times for your GP to refer you in and then for you to be seen in the NHS for your initial investigations. And if that is becoming a big problem, you can go to any care clinic for those initial investigations. Yeah. We can see if you're eligible for NHS treatment and if you are, then you would then join the NHS queue. Yeah, yeah. So that would save a bit of time if mm -hmm. they came in for the pre-treatment tests. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the clinics, obviously, within care, obviously, as Vicky said, it's difficult to answer that for the whole care group, but many of them have no waiting time mm -hmm. um, and and things haven't really been slowed with COVID. When there was the first lockdown, there was a, a, a small backlog mm -hmm. to get through, but that's certainly cleared for most clinics now. Um, so for the most part, there shouldn't be any mm -hmm. any delay in terms of from a COVID perspective, but mm -hmm. do check with your local care clinic. Um, so you, you've covered the next one, which was, do NHS patients have to wait longer because of COVID? Not necessarily because of COVID, but obviously we've just gone it's over because the, of the, the funding, the, funding the way the funding is yeah. going. Um, so the next one was an interesting one about um, Brexit to move away from COVID <laughs> into the frying pan, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Um, will Brexit affect sperm purchases or deliveries from Europe? So. We only use a, a handful of sperm banks in Europe, um, and this is this is an interesting question that that someone's been very astute to realise that there might be problems with bringing sperm in to the UK with Brexit. So. Um, what's really good is that the donor banks in Europe are dealing with it very well, and they've got they've got great teams who are making all the necessary changes, so it, it hasn't really affected us at all we're aware of it and we know that there's some some slight changes that we need to make but the bottom line is no there, there shouldn't be any delay and um, because of brexit with moving samples um into the uk from europe having said that going back to covid and um, obviously <laughs> um the the borders are just a little bit more restricted so um we haven't yet come across any problems um, with 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 COVID and moving samples to and fro, but um, you just never know. So at the moment, as things stand, there are no delays for, from COVID or from Brexit, um, but it is quite a changing situation. Okay. Um, so back to NHS funding, we've got a couple of questions about how many rounds of IBF does the NHS offer? Um, and how do you get NHS funding to a clinic that you want? Yeah. So again, this comes back to the clinical commissioning groups and where, where you're registered with your GP practice because different CCGs will offer different number of treatment cycles. 
Um, so for instance, Pan Lancashire, so you see all the CCGs across Lancashire offer one treatment cycle and some across Cheshire offer two and some offer three. So it really is important as to which CCG you fall under. Um, some offer treatment between the age of 40 and 42 and they'll only offer one cycle um, with two or three cycles up to the age of 40. So it really depends on um, on your CCG and the different eligibility criteria that that they have put in place. Yeah, and um, Professor Charles Kingsland did a video for Fertility Awareness Week about um, all about funding um, NHS funding. So you can go onto the Facebook, Instagram pages to find that. Yeah, that, that was, was around the beginning of November time, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what what about transferring funding? Did you mention that then? So yeah, yeah, so I think you, you can transfer funding from one clinic to another as long as that clinic holds a contract to deliver NHS care. Yeah. And sometimes even if that clinic doesn't, they can approach the CCG to offer on an individual basis that, that delivery of that care for that contract. Um, we've had various patients who've moved, um, have started treatment in one CCG and there's been, for whatever reason, needed to move and we've been able to facilitate that. Yeah. So it's about discussing with the, the clinic that you're choosing to move to and discussing the, if there's any local barriers as to why that would be a problem. Yeah. Um, something's just popped through. I'm due to have frozen egg transfer in the next week or so, and I've been offered the Oxford vaccine for this Friday. Is it okay to have? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and get that. Um. So, move, we're moving away from NHS funding and um, COVID now onto more sort of um, treatmenty type questions. Um, but the first one is about uh, the relationship between care Chester, Manchester, and Liverpool. So there might have been um, there might have been some discussion about the new um, L Liverpool clinic that, that's open. Um, we've been seeing patients there for a while now, but it is um, now uh, HFEA licensed um, to perform embryo transfers. So um, the basic relationship. In, in a nutshell, um, is you would you would have a um, if you were a Liverpool patient, you were seen in Liverpool. You would have all of your appointments in Liverpool, and um, all of your monitoring, blood tests, and um, all of your consultations would be there. Um, and then you could choose either Chester or Manchester to have your egg collection. Um, so then you'd go to Chester or Manchester to have your egg collection. We'd create the embryos and we'd freeze the embryos and then bring the embryos back to Liverpool and you would have subsequent embryo transfers at the Liverpool site. Um, so that's just starting um, just starting this year. Uh, so we've, we've, we got the licence late last year um, and we're starting up now. Um, anything you want to add about that? I think that, that, the only that we, um, as they're what's called as a super satellite yeah. to both Manchester and Chester and the teams all work very closely together and obviously I'm involved with Liverpool on a clinical basis as well mm. um, and the nursing team there also spend time with the Chester and Manchester team so it, 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 it's good communication mm. and making sure that the patients are looked after whichever unit they choose to have the right collection at. Yeah. Close-knit team. Yep. Okay. Um, what does the couple's fertility test involve and what would you be looking for? So this usually involves, and particularly at this at, at Care Chester, involves um, the hormone kit that I mentioned that would be sent out to you to check for what's called your AMH level which is an assessment of the ovarian reserve. And that gives us an idea of how your ovaries might respond to treatment and whether you've got good reserve to be able to produce eggs. So we need eggs to obviously start the treatment pathway. So we need to know that. What goes hand in hand with that is also 
a pelvic ultrasound scan that you would normally attend the unit for, or the clinic, um, and that can assess the ovaries again and give us an idea of the ovarian reserve and look at the uterus and check that the uterus looks a normal shape. And also, um, we do arrange for you to have a semen analysis. So and again, that's a drop-off semen analysis so that we know that we've got sperm and eggs and we've got what appears to be a normal uterus and good ovarian reserve. Yeah. And are there any preparations I need to do ahead of treatment? Vitamins, stopping the pill, etc. So there's really good information. Um, Zeta West Clinic is one of our uh, care centres um, in London and they specialise in um, preparation for pregnancy, pre-IVF and pre-treatment. And I know that probably towards the end of the summer, um, they did a really good Instagram um, live about different supplements and what, what is recommended. Vitamin D is a really hot topic at the moment. Um, so there's lots that it would be really good for you to have a look at the Zeta West um, website because they do specific pre-IVF, the ultimate IVF package for both men, women, what they would need ahead of treatment um, if it was indicated. Yeah. Um, and there's a question here about what vitamins males should take. Um, and I think this is a good one because often we talk a lot about stuff that women should take. And mm -hmm. um, we, we have got a, um, a, a diagnostic uh, test to help us um, determine if there's um, what we call oxidative stress in a sperm sample and that can affect the DNA that's within the sperm and the, there's evidence to say that that could have an effect on um, on fertility. So um, we offer this what we call the SOS test um, and that will help us um, determine if we need to point you in the right direction of some antioxidants um, or if you or if you don't need to take anything at all and everything's fine. Um, What's really important about men is that often it's easy to think I'll just take multivitamins or antioxidants because they're really easy to get hold of. You can you can buy them from, you know, over, over the counter. Uh, but sometimes taking antioxidants without knowing if there's any need to can can be worse. So we can do this test and figure out if um, if taking antioxidants would help you or not. Okay, um, is there anything we can actually do apart from a healthy diet to help our chances? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's lifestyle is important, yeah. sleep hygiene is also important, yeah. um, and obviously we've Just got well being in general. Well -being in general yeah. and, and once you um, enter the, your journey with care, we have access to our um, counselling services. So. So there's a holistic approach to supporting you through your treatment um, and within the counselling services we've also got our support system with the buddy um, system we can be buddied up with um, another couple that might be going through treatment at a similar stage or have already been through treatment and there's lots of information again about support and, and accessing that pathway um, on our website. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of questions about BMI um, that I think we've got time to go over. Mm -hmm. um, does care offer IVF if BMI is over 30? So again, this comes back to um, if you're the care clinic that you're with, if you're having NHS or self-funded treatment. For the NHS eligibility criteria to access NHS-funded treatment, BMI has to be 30 or below. Um, and so that means that you could have self-funded treatment if it's above 30, but um, if you want NHS-funded treatment, most CCGs say it has to be 30 or below. Yeah. Um, the cutoff across the care group um, is generally 35, with an individual then risk assessment up to a BMI of 40, but we wouldn't treat above 40. And it's only the higher risk centres that would treat usually above 35 yeah. um, and I think 
the whole question of BMI is not to be punitive no. about weight, but it's about creating a healthy pregnancy. Yeah. And we know that once your BMI goes above 30 and then above 35, our end point is to achieve a healthy pregnancy. And we want one healthy mum and one healthy baby. Mm. But once you go above that BMI limit, there is increased risk of gestational diabetes and increased risk of preeclampsia. Mm. So it's when we know our end point is a pregnancy, we have to start at the beginning with a healthy BMI. Mm. Yeah, and, and there's questions here about when it's checked, um, and it's well, it's it's checked so that we know if you're eligible for the NHS funding. So it's mm -hmm. right at the beginning of your journey, usually. Mm -hmm. um, and someone here who's got a BMI of thirty point four, would that mean I'm not eligible? Um, yes, it would mean you're not eligible because it's over thirty, so it has to be thirty or below thirty point one, thirty point two, and and over is is over 30 yeah. so they wouldn't they wouldn't um count you as eligible unfortunately okay um so my partner had a semen analysis done and um there was a high, there were high white blood cells um white blood cell level what does this mean um yeah it could it could mean a number of things really and you probably um, want to get in touch and um and talk to one of the one of one of us here um, or at your local care clinic um, it could be a possible infection um, and sometimes what we can do in those cases is is send the sample off for um, a bit more a bit further testing a bit of further testing that we can't do um, usually in in clinic and that would tell us if there is likely to be um, an infection in there um, and then we can treat um, with antibiotics if we needed to um, so I'd say certainly get in touch with your local care clinic and discuss that a bit further. Okay, so medication. Do I get shown how to inject myself with the medication? So um, prior to the pandemic, we would have been having face-to-face -face nurse appointments. And specifically at Chester, we have moved to um, doing this virtually. And on the main care facility website and on the Care Chester page, there is a support tab. And when you click on that, there is a, a link to Injection Teach. And all of the medications that we may prescribe you at any point through your treatment, there is a video of a nurse preparing the medication and then delivering the, the injection and how to do it. And the feedback that we've had is that this is much better mm. because you can watch it over really? and over yeah. and you can even watch it whilst you're doing, doing your injection yeah. and multiple people as well that's can right watch it to yeah help you. and also yeah. rather than trying to remember something that the nurse may have told you a few weeks yeah. back you've got it right there yeah. to, to just do and give you that reassurance so yeah. um and and don't be afraid of it don't be scared of it lots of our patients who are initially a little bit apprehensive mm -hmm. Feel it is really straightforward. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and learn how to do it very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And if you're struggling, just get in touch. Obviously, we can help. Um. Okay. So we're almost out of time. So um, I think just the wrap up. Yeah. Everything's okay. We're we're carrying on. We're all open and and ready to see you. Um. We've got lots of measures in place to keep everyone safe, staff and patients. Um, get the vaccine if you're offered it, that's okay. Um, and I think just thanks for understanding that we faced some challenging yeah. um, circumstances. So thanks for being understanding. Yeah. We, we will try and answer the phone as quickly <laughs> as we can. Yeah. Um, sometimes our staff numbers have been slightly reduced due yeah. to our own individual circumstances, but we are here and we're open and we can't wait to see you yeah <laughs> all right so we'll see you soon i'm sure we're doing another one <laughs> thanks for joining bye, bye. good <laughs>